All right, my friends, welcome yet again. Here we are to another episode Red Delta Project podcast and live feed Q&A, where we're simplifying fitness by taking a fundamental approach to diet and exercise, giving you more power, control, and freedom over your healthy lifestyle. As always, I'm Matt Schifferly, founder of the Red Delta Project, and today's episode is brought to you by the RDP merch store. You get snazzy shirts like this, Paul Wade's old school calisthenics. Link is down below, as well as to other resources like the Dunamic pull-up handles and other associated resources that I recommend that help support the show. Uh, thank you very much in advance for the support. So today's episode is a very important one and a bit of a preview to what's coming up in one of the new books that I'm writing, which is basically all about trying to figure out how the heck fitness works, which is basically avoiding what I call fitness ripoffs. Now, the story behind this is that when I look back on my previous fitness history of the work I did and the diets and the workouts and everything like that. To be perfectly honest, I feel like most of everything I've done over my past was not worth it. Flat out, if I had to do my whole fitness journey all over again, I would have done way different stuff. And most of it, I honestly wouldn't have done. And looking back, I would say that a lot of what I did was not worth it. It was too much time, too much effort, too much cost, and I didn't get enough back. Now, in the more economic world of things, when we pay too much and don't get enough back, we would usually consider that a ripoff. Like, I got ripped off by this car dealership. I spent $5,000, and now I find out the Kelly Blue Book was $2,000. I got ripped off kind of thing. You invested more than what you got back. And I'm using that in both the literal and metaphorical sense in fitness. Because from a fundamental perspective, when it comes to getting in shape, we have to recognize that what holds the key to your success isn't what kind of diet you follow. It's not what kind of workout you're following or whether you're doing calisthenics versus free weights or five by five versus high volume training. That stuff is more of the superficial approaches that, while not unimportant, aren't truly responsible for the results you want. Instead, a fundamental approach recognizes that it's about observing and bringing yourself in alignment to the fundamental processes of both mother and human nature. I talked at length about the processes of uh, mother nature, like stimulus and adaptation, which governs our training, uh, consumption versus expenditure, which governs the healthiness of our diets and stuff. But the big part that's missing for many people in making fitness work is that of human nature. Like you can have the best diet, the best workout and everything like that, and still completely fall on your face with nothing but failure, even though on paper everything's supposed to work. And that's because we often fail to take into account the processes and principles of human nature, which to be very general at the, co at the uh, cost of going with uh, the uh, approaches of uh, you know, human complexities, is we are very much motivated with the balance between cost to reward. Now, at the end of the day, your success in any sort of diet and exercise habits largely boils down to how much you feel you're investing in those habits and how much you feel you're getting back on that investment. If you are investing what feels like big amounts of effort and time and energy, and yes, sometimes money, if you feel like you're putting a lot in, but you're not getting very much back, then your motivation to do that thing consistently is going to tank. And there's nothing about like willpower and I'm gonna be strong and I'm gonna force myself. Forget it. The most successful methods out there are the ones that we put in a certain amount and what we get back, we feel like, oh, this was so worth it. This was so worth it. I would do that 10 times over. Oh yeah, this was, oh wow, holy smokes, way in your favor. And this is what we want to observe as a fundamental objective about your success in making fitness work for you, is that no matter what you're putting in, you wanna be getting a hell of a lot back out of it. 
And if you find yourself in the opposite perspective where you're like, I'm spending so much to do this thing, but it's not worth it. Don't force yourself into that. I know there's a lot of stuff in our fitness culture telling you the opposite. You got to force it. You got to want it. You got to be disciplined and make yourself do these things and all that. Yes, that is something that happens from time to time. Yes, that is something that we do for short periods of time. For example, like there were bike races I used to do where it's like, I really don't really want to do this bike race. It's cold. It's rainy. It sucks. I've you know, got a sore leg, stitched up arm and everything, but I did the race anyway because I did ultimately want to do it. I didn't want to let my team down. But that's not what racing was in general because it was way worth it. I got a lot out of it for what I invested in. And when we find ourselves investing a lot and not getting enough out, you, my friend, are essentially experiencing a ripoff. You are being ripped off by whatever that is. And we're going to talk about how you can avoid these situations and get out of them in today's episode. But let me say hi to some of the people coming on here. Bygone Journey, Simon, how's it going? Hello, everybody. Um, by the way, I should also mention that uh, my apologies if the camera seems a little bit less of um, you know up to par right now. I'm doing this on my iPhone, the uh, usual computer, then uh, the webcam and everything that I do it on. Cam the uh, computer is experiencing some technical difficulties, was hoping to have it up and running for today's episode, and uh, that wasn't the case. So I apologize if I'm not getting to questions and stuff quite as quickly because it's a tiny little screen here. So here's the deal, is that when I talk about cost versus benefit, keep in mind that a lot of that is very much subjective. It's a very personal thing from one person to the next. Because for some people, a cost may be relatively small. For other people, it may be very, very big, or it may even be a detriment. Take, for example, going and uh, you know, working out in a gym. Go and you visit a gym. Now, to some people, that's going to take a lot of effort to go and work out at a gym. Maybe the gym is far away. Maybe it's way out of their commute. Maybe they have a very, very busy lifestyle and even that 15 minutes to drive to the gym and then 15 minutes to drive home or back to work, that half hour, that's a big, huge cost to their busy life. Maybe they just don't like being in a gym. They feel very self-conscious. They have bad memories of going to like the high school gym and getting picked on, whatever the case may be. If they feel like it takes a lot to go to a gym, that comes at a very significant cost. So in order for that to be worth it, they've better be getting some very big rewards. And if they feel like they're not getting it, then they're not going to be motivated to do it. On the other hand though, there are those out there, of course, who feel like going to the gym is their sanctuary. They find themselves and lose themselves there at the same time. There's no place they would rather be. They have this one gym that they love to go to. It's this hardcore, heavy metal, banging, you know, kind of, 80s muscle building gym this type you see in pumping iron and stuff and they gladly drive an hour each way to go to this thing All right so that would be an example of how for one person even driving 15 minutes to go to a gym is a high cost but for another person they would gladly expend twice the cost because they're getting so much out of going to that gym and that's the thing that we really want to recognize about avoiding fitness ripoffs is that it doesn't matter what someone else says is supposedly good or great or best. Like for me in yoga, like I can't stand yoga. You'd think a bodyweight guy like me would be all over yoga. But every time I do yoga, I feel terrible. I feel better if I go on a transatlantic flight with lots of turbulence afterwards. I never feel good physically, mentally, and so forth after a yoga class. So. I have friends who are like, yoga is so amazing. Oh my gosh, it changed my life and I feel so amazing, blah, blah, blah. Great for them, wonderful. But the fact of the matter is, I don't like it. I don't get much value out of it. So they go to yoga, fantastic. For me though, it would be a mistake for me to go to yoga and force myself to do that. Just because it takes so much effort for me to do it and I don't really get hardly anything out of it. So yoga for me would be a quote unquote ripoff. But for them, it's not. So this is kind of a 
lesson of steer your own ship. It doesn't matter what someone else says is supposedly great. If you don't get that benefit from it, screw it. It doesn't matter. It's important only if it's important to you. Let me get to some other uh, questions here. Ooh, ouch, bygone journey. Broke my collarbone. My shoulders are lower than usual. Now I can get a deeper range of motion and push up. Very good, fantastic. And uh, Finn, uh, that's a injury I've luckily avoided uh, in the biking world as I haven't broken my collarbones. Hopefully not ever. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Skywalker, Skywalker says, looking like a brick house. Thank you very much. It's the t-shirts. You know, I, I like to buy these t-shirts from uh, the merch uh, company. They, it's uh, like an athletic cut, very flattering to the uh, figure. And uh, I think it, it's really good and comfortable for um, working out too. So when we're doing these sorts of assessments of what's worth it to you and stuff, it's not something that we want to necessarily belittle our own experience with. Because when we boil it down to cost to benefit, the way we can increase your chances of success is either decrease the cost of what you're trying to do and increase the benefit. Now, the benefit, by and large, a lot of times we come to the stage expecting far more than we may actually get. You know, a lot of people are like, okay, how long until I do a one-arm push-up? Well, who says it's even going to happen ever? <laughs> Lots of people. Unfortunately, the standard is that most people never get what they want out of fitness. I'm just putting it out there. I just got to be honest with you. The majority of people who seek to build muscle and lose weight and stuff, they never get what they want. They get some of what they want, but it's not nearly to the degree that what they want. And partially because uh, they're either aiming too high or they're doing things that are terribly inefficient. You know, they're doing a workout that's an hour and a half long, and really there's only like five minutes there that's actually moving the needle for them. So that's why my perspective and approach here at Red Delta has always been, let's decrease the cost associated with diet and exercise habits. Because if we can decrease the cost, then your motivation and your desire to do the thing and do it very well doesn't have to be world class, and you don't have to make your dreams come true in a week and a half just for you to keep eating well and doing exercise. That's why I'm such a big fan of things like calisthenics, isometrics, my eat to satisfy strategies, the 3P approach when it comes to diet of every meal. You focus on plant, protein, and portion sizes, right? These things are so incredibly efficient that the cost associated with them should be relatively low. And if the cost is relatively low, you're still going to have a lot of motivation to do them, and they're still going to be very much worthwhile, even if it's not radical life-changing stuff going from one week to the next. <clears throat> Let's see, what else can I do? Remember, if you put Hey Matt in the comment section, that's something I know that's directed to me uh, directly. Uh, let's see. So uh, Kubota08 asks, Hey Matt. Should you train everyday calisthenics even though you slightly feel muscular pain or uh, is it uh, too uh, dangerous? So here's partially what I'm talking about is when we're setting up our training methods, we always want to evaluate the cost associated with them. Who cares what someone says is the best workout program? Like I could say, yes, train every day or train once a week. Both answers are just a random guess. You know, I could just, might as well just shake an eight ball. Should we train every day? Outlook doubtful. Here are your lucky not lottery numbers kind of thing. It's like, it doesn't matter. It really isn't that important. Your frequency is all about how frequently should you train to get what you want out of it. Now, if you train more frequently and you notice that you're more tired, your muscles are sore, you're just, your motivation is dipping down and stuff like that, cut it back. You want to get into your workouts at a frequency that I, I like to use the word hunger. Like I'm hungry for this exercise. Like my muscles are hungry for it. When I jump on that pull up bar behind me and it's been several days and I'm recovered and everything, I'm not getting on going like, okay, let's get these pull ups. And I get on the bar and like, oh God, my shoulders. Oh geez. All right. Well, let's, let's get this over with. No, I'm like getting to the pull up bar and I hang and I'm like, oh yeah. Oh, the bar feels good in my hands. Like my back lights up, 
my muscles are like, yeah, let's go, let's crush it, let's bash it, smash it. It's like my muscles are literally feeding on the tension I'm giving them and it feels amazing. That's what you want in your workouts because even that simple act of hanging from the bar, I'm immediately getting positive feedback of like, this is a good idea. I'm really glad I'm doing this. So base your frequency off of that. I don't care what the science says. You know, someone's like, train twice a week, once a week, blah, 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 blah. It's all guesswork. It's a pure guesswork. Might as well throw a dart at a number and give you that. It's no more legitimate than that. Yeah, sure, a lot of people, it's like probably twice, three times a week and stuff is a good way to go, but who cares? None of that has any relevance whatsoever to what you should be doing because we're all different and we're all going to have different experience from things based off training frequency, how fit you are, how hard you're pushing yourself, the duration you're pushing yourself, the intensity, the type of exercise you're doing, your alignment, your condition of your soft tissues, your tension control, your sleep, your diet, your stress relief. I mean, I'm just barely scratching the surface, but all of this has a very significant impact on how you're gonna feel if you work out today. Okay? So that's why I have a freestyle approach. I don't have any sort of workout program that I follow at all as far as train this many times a week or it's Monday, do this. I just wait until my muscles are hungry. <laughs> like, how is the back doing? Nah, not so great. Okay, wait another couple days. You know, if, if, if it's good to go, go. If you're good to go every day, go. If you're good to go once every two or three days, go then. You know, go off of when is it going to be the most rewarding for you? Don't listen to some Yahoo on YouTube telling you when you should work out. We don't know. We have no business whatsoever telling you when you should work out, what kind of frequency. We have no credibility at all for being able to tell you that sort of thing. You go when you're ready to go. If you're ready to go every day, go. If you want to take a couple days off, take a couple days off because you want those workouts to be as reliably satisfying as possible. You want to get a lot of enjoyment out of it. Who cares if it's hard? That's the worst thing to base your workouts off of. You want it to feel like, oh, my workouts are feeling good, they're progressive, and I'm improving things. That's what you want to base it off of. And if you want to do it every day, great. If that's not what's happening every day, then don't worry about it. You're not missing out uh, at all. <clears throat> Boy Gone Journey says, yeah, fitness is hard, man. Even when universally you have to give uh, more to get less. For example, the time you spent to reach one arm pull-up is too much and if you stop, you lose it. Yeah, so that's another thing to consider. We all have the potential to achieve a very high level of proficiency in something, okay? But remember that we all have that level that's attainable, but it's not maintainable. It's attainable, but not maintainable, okay? We all know where that is. So it's different for everybody. I always use the analogy of climbing Mount Everest. All right, someone, I think it was Mallory when they climbed it, or Hillary, and a reporter asked him like, oh, now that you've conquered the mountain, uh, how does it feel? And they kind of shot back with, conquered the mountain? Dude, nobody ever conquers Mount Everest. You climb up as high as you can, maybe you get to the top, you do a little happy dance and celebration, and then you get the hell out of there because you can't stay there. We all have that ability, that same sort of thing when it comes to fitness, like one-arm pull-ups, single-digit body fat, and so on. We all have the ability to get to someplace, but it may not be something you can maintain. And that, again, boils largely down to cost to benefit ratio. Like one arm pull ups or single digit body fat, the cost could be so high that you're like, I can do this, but I can't do this all the time forever. So that's why athletes, bodybuilders, and figure competitors, they'll recognize that and be like, I can be in that shape at that level but only for a short period of time because there's no way I can maintain it. So I'll time it for when I need it most, when I step on stage, a day of a big competition, a photo shoot or whatever. So they know they're overspending themselves. They know they're spending more than they can possibly maintain. And therefore it's like, I only needed this. And once that competition is done, boom, they regress and they cut back because they, and that's planned. It's like, I'm not going to maintain single digit body fat. Or I got a one arm pull up, great, but I can't keep that. So I don't plan on trying to keep it. Instead, I just recognize I can get there, but I can't stay there. And that is part of the cost to benefit assessment. 
and allocation of what's worth it to you. Because otherwise, you're just going to keep banging your head against the wall and trying to overspend yourself. It's like constantly putting yourself in credit card debt for junk that you don't need or even appreciate. You're just putting out more than is worth it to you and good luck trying to maintain that and keep your motivation up. And it's all down to having that assessment of, yeah, sure. And a lot of times people will say that, it's like, but this works, but this diet works, but this workout program works. So what? I don't care if it works. I don't care to be like, this works great. Who cares? I don't, the number of times people have said, this is a great program, this is a great thing, and this is awesome and stuff, and I got great results. And I always ask them, then why the hell aren't you doing it anymore? You know, if it's so great, why aren't you doing it? If it is so great and wonderful and awesome, we shouldn't have had to stop it unless you found something better, right? So we want to recognize that if something is really, really good and the cost is relatively low, that's when it's easier to maintain. And that's what we want to base most of our approach off of. But you're going to have to make those decisions for yourself. And this is part of being an adult. This is part of being a mature exerciser is being able to look at the fitness landscape and saying no to most things. You can't say yes to everything. They know this in the business world. Lots of people will say the key to success is learning to say no. I think there's even books written about it. Like say no, set up your boundaries and stuff. Same exact thing. I say no to most things. Do you have any idea how many offers I get every single week from companies that want to sponsor this podcast? They want to send me products. They want to send me sponsorship. They want to spend me bags of money saying, please, you know, just mention our, you know, uh, green tea weight loss extract, blah, blah, blah kind of thing. And we'll pay you uh, X amount of money for every mention or something. I say no to about 98% of these things because they're not who Red Delta Project is. It's not who I am. It's like, yeah, sure, I could use the money, but who cares? You know, it would work, but it doesn't matter. That's not a good enough basis. That's not a high enough standard. And just because it works doesn't mean you should do it. And just because it's great for someone else doesn't mean it's great for you. It's all about having that personal assessment of, is this really good for me though? Is this really what I want? And that's why a lot of times people will look and be like, Matt, you don't do X, you don't run, you don't uh, do muscle ups, you don't practice skills, you don't fast, you don't foam roll, you don't do a million and one other things that everybody out there says I should be doing. And the answer is, of course I don't do these things because they have zero value to me. Like I could be able to do a hundred muscle ups. Is that going to change anything in my life? Absolutely not. Is that going to bring any sort of conceivable benefit to me? None at all. So why in the world would I invest the time and the energy and the effort in order to do that because it's just simply not worth it to me but who knows like i could have a change of heart you know next month i could somehow for whatever reason become obsessed with muscle ups then the tables turn but for the time being if it's not worth it to you it's not worth doing it's that simple uh bygone asks uh here hey matt any idea on how to avoid neck pain during various body weight or weightlifting workout because I'm always having neck tension uh, before my muscles give up. Is it, It's so frustrating. So uh, check out your alignment first and foremost. Like if you've got, you know, the turkey neck thing going on here, you know, and a lot of times it's not in the neck. It's probably more of like you're holding a kyphotic posture and your neck is forward like this. And as a result, your alignment is just all wonky and the tension that should be going to your muscles is going right up into your, your neck or possibly your upper traps. Because remember, your upper traps feed right up into your neck. So it's fine to have some tension in your neck. You're supposed to, absolutely. Neck muscles work very much during almost all body weight exercise. But take a video of yourself and see if your neck is forward or if you're really craning up or something that is taking your neck out of a neutral position. And so what's going on with that is remember that a lot of times the cost associated with doing things is also in just flat out discomfort. Okay. So analogy is I used to really dislike uh, some activities because I didn't have comfortable gear, right? And like gloves and things like that. 
But when I got more comfortable with better gloves for cycling, I have these ergonomic grips on my mountain bikes now, I have uh, some uh, form-fitting ski boots and stuff, suddenly it's like, oh my gosh, this is great. I really enjoy this activity a lot more. Why? Because I got rid of the pain. I got rid of a lot of the discomfort associated with that pain. Comfort is a very good thing because the less discomfort you have to employ upon yourself while doing your exercise, the better. Now, I know, I know. A lot of guys, I, I used to be this way too, where it's like, ah, comfort's for the weak, you know, kind of thing. Com comfort's going to make everybody weak and a pansy in life and stuff. And I used to literally do things purely because they were uncomfortable. I would work out without water. I would do it in clothing that didn't fit very well. I would purposely, I would, maybe it was a martial arts thing, I don't know, but I would purposely use equipment that would cut up and tear up my hands and feet. I'd ride my bicycle barefoot with you know, spiked pedals. And I would uh, use, um, back when I was a taiko drummer, I would use uh, drumming sticks that I would sand to be rough so they would give me blisters on my hands and stuff. Because I thought that anything that makes me pain and discomfort is going to be beneficial. No, all you're doing is spending more than you need to from an effort standpoint. But now I have gloves. I have comfortable grips. I have comfortable shoes. Uh, Any time that I can take out discomfort that's not necessary, you're decreasing the cost to your training. And it's not like you're ever going to make it easier. Because on a mountain bike, you know, in bike racing, we always say you ne it never gets easier. You just get faster. So just by having the gloves and the form-fitting handles, that little bit of effort that I constantly had to spend towards dealing with blisters on my hands, I can now put into how do I ride my bike faster? And as a result, more comfort here means more speed going forward. So it's not about being tough and being a wimp or anything like that. It's about putting your resources where they are going to do you the most good. Mariano, good to see you, my friend. Hey, Matt. COVID caught me. Oh no. Any tip in the diet that you experience helping you in the recovery? Um, yeah. I mean, just and everything that keeps your body healthy in general is still going to be helpful for uh, when you're dealing with illness as well. So lots of really good food, whole foods is really good, fruits, vegetables, uh, and pay attention to your energy level while you're eating too. Because when we are dealing with a virus, your immune system requires a buttload of energy. That's why you're so tired, because your immune system is essentially taking a lot of your energy and fighting off the virus. So pay attention to what your energy level is like shortly after eating. So if you eat something, and then afterwards you're like, oh man, I'm just so wiped, I'm not feeling very good after that, then that could be a sign that your body's further stressed by that food a little bit. But if you eat you know, something else, and afterwards you're like, ah, feeling kind of good, like maybe turning the corner on this COVID thing. Okay. Pay attention to that. And a lot of times what ends up happening is that type of eating is actually going against conventional dietary advice. Let me give you an example. Years, years ago, back in high school, I used to constantly be sick because I, at the time, mistakenly thought a good diet is one that's restricted and doesn't have all these different food groups in it. and doesn't have this kind of food and that kind of food and everything like that. Very restrictive, got to eat strict and clean all the time kind of stuff. And I went out uh, to a restaurant with my father one time and I was just like, I can't cut this cold. I feel like crap, my throat is sore. I mean, this would be like this for months. And back when I was younger, I would literally be sick all winter long. And so eventually you have a breaking point. We had uh, lunch and uh, I sat down, I'm like, all right, I don't care, whatever. Uh, Philly cheesesteak, potato chips whatever. Uh, I'll just deal with it later kind of thing. And it was like hitting a switch. I had the Philly cheesesteak, onions, mushrooms, provolone cheese, you know, full grease, the whole nine yards, right? Philly cheesesteak, side of chips and everything. And afterwards, it, I went from like 10% to 90% within 20 minutes because I was finally feeding my body food it could use, right? I wasn't just snacking on rice cakes and protein shakes my, and, and starving my body of what it needed to fight off the virus. Of course, mentally and emotionally, I was like, oh no, I just messed up. I totally blew my diet. Why did I eat that Philly cheesesteak? I totally rest messed up. When I really should have been listening to my body that was like, oh, thank God, we've got some flipping calories we can use. Fat, 
protein. This is great. We can use this stuff to fight the virus. And I felt so good physically, but mentally and emotionally, I wasn't feeling so good because I thought I messed up. When in reality, I hadn't messed up. I finally was eating well. So pay attention to how you feel from food, and that's going to kind of help steer you in the direction you want to go in and screw any diet tips that tell you otherwise. You feel good, you're eating good. Bottom line. William coming on. Hey, Matt, what are your thoughts on uh, statics? Example, front lever plans, blah, blah, blah. How do you view the athletes focusing on these moves? Uh, fantastic. I mean, it takes a lot of strength and a lot of coordination. Um, just me personally, I just never had any real interest in them. You know, it's like learning the juggle for me. Like, I, I, I just don't care. Um, yes, it takes a lot of strength. It's very impressive. It's very cool. But when I got into calisthenics, I came on to it from like, I've always had like a bodybuilding-esque uh, approach to strength training. Even when I went through a little bit of a powerlifting phase, it was like, it's still bodybuilding kind of thing. So I used to take magazines, like bodybuilding magazines. Yes, this is back in the day when gyms had like magazines and stuff. And I would literally take the, you know, like flex magazine, here's a workout for your shoulders and, you know, kind of thing. And I would do the exact same thing, but with body weight training, like rep by rep, set by step, exercise for exercise. What can I do to do the body weight equivalent? So I've always just had that approach. So again, this is boiling down to what's important to you. There's only two good reasons to do any sort of diet or exercise habit. It's either desired or required. Okay? Now, if it's required, that usually isn't the case, but sometimes it does happen. Like if uh, the example I give all the time is PT tests. I want to be a police officer. I want to pass this test. Well, you got to be able to do 100 push-ups in like three minutes or whatever, right? Dude, then you got to be able to do 100 push-ups. You got to be able to do push-ups. Sorry, there's nothing for it, but you got to be able to do that because it's now a requirement for a goal that you have. I want to run a marathon, then you're going to have to be running. But outside of that, if it's not something that you personally desire, like I don't care about running, I don't care about doing 100 straight push-ups in three minutes, then there's no good reason to force yourself to do those things. Zero. I'm talking zero. Big, fat, goose egg. No reason to do it at all. Again, you're going to have people who are like, oh, it's awesome, and you're not a real man unless you can do this, and you're not strong unless you can do that. BS every step of the way. Because if it's not important to you and it's not required, it's not important. Full stop. It's that simple. And if someone's like, well, you should be able to do this, you should be doing this, I'm like, you better give me a damn good reason to, that I need to do that. When I saw my chiropractor and he's like, okay, you need to lay on this foam roller on your neck in order to realign your neck, because I was having some issues and stuff. I'm like, I don't want to do this. And he's, but he showed me x-rays, he showed me the research, and he's like, you do this, you're going to have better alignment. And again, if you're always in doubt, at least give it a try. Tried it, within two days, I was like, oh, wow. Wow, that is, woo, that feels so much better. Okay, yeah, bingo. Investment in it, tried it out, but I got a big reward very quickly. And I'm not a fan of these things of like, do this hard thing and it's going to pay off six months from now. And it's going to pay off a long time. No, dude, I need instant gratification. I need things to work now. I need some sort of positive feedback immediately for me to believe in it. Not six months from now, not eight months from now, not a week and a half from now. I want something that's going to tell me I'm on the right path and getting a benefit from it. ASAP. And if I don't get it, I'm out. It's that simple. And I think you should have the same thing too. I know a lot of people are like, oh, instant gratification, the marshmallow test, people are pansies because they can't delay gratification. Bullshit. You want something giving you some sort of positive feedback very, very, very quickly. Because anything that's gonna be great long-term should also have some sort of a benefit to some degree in the short term. And the research bears this out in social research. You know, things that are long-term, like a lot of times people like investing for retirement and stuff like that. Uh, in uh, James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, he's like, you got to get those habits to be as easy as possible. And if there's no instant gratification or feedback right there, at least take away the pain. So instead of investing into your 401k, just set it up to be on autopilot. Set it up to be automatic. So that way there's no perceived pain when that uh, part of your paycheck goes right to your 401k. 
it's automatic. You don't have to think about it. If you have to think about it, then it's like, well, this sucks now. And there's a benefit 40 years from now. Why would you do that? You're not going to have good motivation for doing that. So that's why I'm a big fan of instant gratification. Diet and exercise habits should feel good today. They should give you feedback that makes you enjoy it now. Like when I grab onto that pull-up bar and my back lights up, it's like, oh, this feels so good. This is a great stretch. You do a couple sets and you're like, I got a pump going on. This feels amazing. I go out for a mountain bike ride and within five minutes, the stress of the day starts leaving me as I'm exercising out the kinks in the body and I'm having fun and stuff. Instant gratification is a wonderful thing and we should definitely embrace it and use it to our full advantage. <clears throat> Excuse me. Milone, uh, Mil sorry, I can't really see on the phone here. Milana, hey Matt, if someone likes working out with machines uh, in just missing uh, put because calisthenics is more healthy and natural, I say just do whatever the hell you want. You know, like I don't care if healthy, I don't care natural. You know, what is natural? Working out isn't natural. Animals don't work out. We just do kind of thing. So, dude, if you like machines, use machines, especially if you're getting that feedback. I, the, la the worst thing you can do in your workouts, and this happens all the time. I see people, they get into some sort of a fitness dogma. Like they're like kettlebells. Okay, got to be a kettlebell guy. I got kettlebell tattoos on me and everything like that. And then they go and they use a lat pull-down machine. And you can see like they're conflicted. They're like, that felt good. And they're like, but I'm a kettlebell guy. I got to be using kettlebells. I got to be on calisthenics. Oh, but that pull down machine, that felt great kind of thing. No, if it feels good, just do it. Don't put up limitations that don't need to be there. That's what dogmas do is they put up walls between you and what you want to be doing. And nine times out of 10, those walls only hold you back. They prevent you from doing the things that you enjoy and having a, um, oh, a good way to go after uh, those sorts of things. Pardon me, excuse me. <clears throat> Cassius Scipio, so happy to catch Matt live after such a long time. It's good to see you too, Cassius. Thank you very, very much, very much. Dave, David in the house. How's it going, my friend? Hey, Matt, when doing your knee raises, hip circles during warm ups, I have problems getting my heel close to my hips. Is this something I just need to keep working on? Uh, so what he's talking about is when we lift our leg up, you know, kind of like in a, a, you know, preparing to do a kick and stuff, it's literally a squat motion. It's just reversing against gravity. So it is a squat. I think in my book, uh, Bodyweight Training for Martial Arts, in fact, the initial exercise for the squat chain isn't actually squatting with your body. It's lifting up your leg nice and high. But yeah, you're absolutely right. That heel isn't going to get like on your body but so to speak, because it requires a good amount of flexion in the knee. So hamstrings and calf to a degree. And of course your hip too. That's the other thing is hip. Now you will run also into the limitation of just pressing your calf into your hamstring as well. And just judging by the size of your calf and your hamstrings, then you're just going to press those muscles against each other. And that's as far as you're going to get. And depending on limb length of your lower leg and all these other sort of things, you're just going to get so close and then that'll be it. So by all means, yes, definitely pull your heel closer to your hips as much as you can, but whatever you get, you get. And if it's a mobility and strength thing, then as you get more stronger and stuff, it'll get closer, but you may be at the limit of that range. And if that's the case, then you're done. You're, you're getting as close as you can and you've gotten what you can out of the exercise. So strive for more for sure. But uh, if you don't get it, don't worry too much about it. You're not going to be missing out on anything if you, if you, you get that sort of thing. <laughs> Jason asking, what are your current macros? What do you suggest for others? So my macros right now, um, I have uh, some fat, um, protein, and carbohydrate, and a touch of alcohol. And God knows what the hell those are. <laughs> I have the foggiest idea. No clue whatsoever. Probably if I had to guess... Uh, heavier on the carbohydrate side of things than the fat side of things. Uh, but that could change if I have a pizza tonight or something uh, of those orders. I don't worry about that stuff is what I'm basically saying. I don't worry about it. I don't care about it unless I'm stepping on stage. I don't think it's really something you need to worry about. Um, basically, like, again, I follow my 3P strategy, uh, I, which is every meal. I have, do I have protein? 
Do I have some sort of plant-based foods? And am I eating enough to satisfy, but not so much that I'm overfeeding myself? That's about all I really base my diet off of, to be perfectly honest with you. Everything else is like, yeah, I don't care, whatever. Because largely I found all trying to track and manage all that stuff just doesn't, isn't worth it. You know, I, I'm full on. I used to be in that category. I used to count every gram. I had my fitness pal and counting calories and counting fat grams and protein and stuff like that. And to be honest with you, I don't think it helped me at all. <laughs> there was no benefit to it. All it did was make me more anxious about food. And if anything, I would say it probably held me back because I was sticking to a formula that wasn't really right for me. Because it would be like, you have to eat this many calories and this much protein and stuff like that. And when I went with more of just a, dude, if I want a pizza, I'm going to eat a pizza. If I want more food, I'm going to eat more food. I'm, I'm pretty sure I ramped a lot of stuff up. I started consuming more just in general. And I didn't get fatter at all. If anything, I started to just build more muscle. And whatever formula I was following was just not right for me. So I'm much more of an intuitive eater is basically what I'm saying. I just kind of, I eat whatever I want, whenever I want, as much as I want. And I base things largely off of how things make me look, feel, and perform. And I know when my diet's going off the rails because I'm like, Ugh, that's okay. Abs are looking a little softer there and my energy level is in the tank. All right, probably a bag of Doritos isn't the best lunch for me. Not that I would actually do that, but you know what I'm saying. But boy, if I like rice, I know I do very well with rice. I'm like, oh, every time I eat rice, I feel really good afterwards. Well, pay attention. I don't care how many carbohydrates and stuff like that. How many calories and carbohydrates was that? I don't care. I eat this sushi. I feel good. That's all I need to base things off of. Now, I know that's, that's not what a lot of people like to do. A lot of people like the MyFitnessPal and the spreadsheets and stuff like that. Um, in that case, seek uh, advice for someone else, an expert who does go by that route. You know, I'm not saying it's bad or anything. I'm just saying that's not my way of doing things, and I'm certainly better off without it. Uh, but if you want to take advice from an expert or someone on YouTube, make sure that they are also in alignment with what you're trying to do. Now, you don't ask a plumber for electrician advice. <laughs> and same thing with me. Like I love calisthenics. I'm fairly proficient in kettlebells and sort of ideas. I'm the worst guy in the world to teach you how to do Olympic lifting. You came to me and said, can you teach me how to snatch? Nope. <laughs> I can kind of peck my way through it and guess, but honestly, you don't want me teaching you Olympic barbell snatches. Ask that guy over there who's like the state champion Olympic barbell snatcher. You want to be asking folks who are in alignment with your goals for sure. <clears throat> Renee, how's it going? Do you get any experience or advice from a forearm flexor pain like golfer's elbow? Uh, so yeah, a lot of pain like this and stuff is a sign of a misalignment. A lot of times it's in the back, as I'm now learning, right? I used to have a lot of that stuff in my arms. Uh, not anymore. Not even close. Nothing whatsoever. Um, a lot of it, it's doing kyphotic posture. Welcome to America. You know, we're all like this all day. And then we do pull-ups and curls and stuff like this. And that's where we have a little bit of internal rotation and the force is here rather than here. Uh, I'm pointing to the inside of my elbow for those listening on the audio kind of thing. So <laughs> extend, lift that chest on up, get, get those shoulders back. This is what I've been learning from my chiropractor that I am always too much like this, probably from my years of being like this on the bike, All right? So back like so, lift the chest up with your exercises. And for right now, if you have that issue, be uh, mindful that those tissues take forever to heal, unfortunately. So give it plenty of time to heal. Don't do things that hurt. Lift the chest up when you're doing all your push-pull movements. That may very well help. Dave is back again. Uh, so again, this is all coming around to how do we make this whole diet and exercise thing easier? How do we make it as easy as possible, seamless as possible, and as rewarding as possible till we can tip that cost to benefit ratio? Always coming back to that topic. Uh, hey, Matt, squatting. Everyone needs to do some sort of squatting, even if not very deep that moment, just my thought. So I would, I would agree with that. However, I would say squatting movement pattern. Okay, so you talk to squatting to different people and they think you're talking about different things. For a lot of people in the strength world, you're like, I've got squats today. They're gonna think barbell on the back, back squats, right? And yeah, that's legitimate, but it's not the only way to squat. 
you know, we got goblet squats, we got front squats. I, but when we talk about chain training, which is how I base things off of here at RDP, that's the squatting movement pattern. So as we were talking about earlier, you know, picking up your leg like this, this is a squatting movement pattern. This is squatting. Dan John, uh, when I did uh, my RKC years ago, you know, he said that for a while, he had some sort of a surgery, I think, or an injury. I forget exactly what he was talking about. He was doing bear crawls on the floor. He's like, this was my squat workout while I was recovering. He was doing bear crawls. Why? Because he was bringing his knees up to his chest, hips closer to the heels. So for me, the squatting movement pattern is anything where your ass is getting closer to your heel. So that includes leg press. That includes sissy squats. That includes lunges. That includes jumping and walking up a flight of stairs, right? So the squatting movement pattern. But uh, I know what you're saying. Absolutely. And get what you can for range of motion too. It's a good mobility exercise for sure. Questions coming in fast and furious now. Uh, Mar Marjin, sorry, again, my eyes, I need to get my eyes checked. Uh, Matt, just wondering what kind of food you like to eat snacks in between meals. Personally, can't get enough of the day. The only three meals. Oh yeah, I'm totally right there with you. I learned this back in high school. Again, this is kind of a along the idea of you know, follow your body. So I would have breakfast and I would pack up a big lunch. So if, you know, I'm dating myself now, but remember that scene in the breakfast club where Emilio Estevez's character, they're like lunchtime. And he literally has a grocery bag of food and he starts pulling out sandwiches, multiple sandwiches and stuff. And he has his full grocery bag. I was literally that guy in high school. I literally, that exact same paper grocery bag, like two or three sandwiches, an apple, a bag of cookies, chips, uh, maybe some granola bars, like, and I would just keep pulling that stuff out. So I would have breakfast, go all day to lunchtime, eat all of that in one sitting, and then you know eat a snack or something when I got home from school. And what I noticed was that every time I was abstaining from food, my energy level boom, tanked. I couldn't concentrate very well, so whatever class I had before lunch, I'd just be like in this day is like, can we eat now? Can we eat now? Um, you know, Matt, are you paying attention? Sure. When's lunch kind of thing. I was just ravenously hungry. And then I would eat all that food. And then the, day, the class afterwards, I'd be like, I want to go to bed. <laughs> I want to take a nap. I can't stay awake kind of thing. And then the teacher was like, we're going to show a movie class. I'm like, great. Boom. Out like a light on my desk. And then I started to notice that, you know, why am I waiting until lunch? to start eating. So I'd go to first period class, come back to my locker, change out the books, grab one of the sandwiches. And then, you know, I'd eat on the way to class. And then second period class, go back, change out my books, grab a granola bar and an apple. And I'd graze throughout the day and my energy level stayed up and I could do that. And that's how I became a grazer. So to your question, like, what do you eat? It's like, I almost don't even eat meals. I just kind of graze throughout the day. Maybe I'll have a dinner or something like that. But I graze because that's what I found just works for me. It's a lot easier for me to maintain. It's a lot easier for me to manage with my schedule. I don't need a lunch period or anything. And it's a lot easier for me to keep my energy level up. And I'm basing that purely 100% on experience, nothing else whatsoever. Now that did screw me over as a coach when, you know, years ago when they're like, you need to eat several small meals a day to be boost up your metabolism. Now to me, that made perfect sense. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you need to eat several small meals a day to keep your metabolism high and don't eat three meals, blah, 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 blah. And, so, and I was going off of just the study that I did with an experience of one because it worked for me. But so what? <laughs> so what if it's great for me? It doesn't mean it's good for advice for me to be doling out, right? So I still do that. But when people are like, I feel really good if I don't have breakfast and I do a fast until noon, I'm like, great, good on you. I know that's bad for me. <laughs> that's not going to work for me. I've done that before many times. It's always a sucky experience. So it's not good for me, but if it's good for you, go for it. And so for me, I guess you could say I always snack. <laughs> I'm always snacking, but it's real food. It's, all, it's actual food. If I'm having a snack, my snack is a sandwich. It's not like, you know, little uh, snacky things from a vending machine kind of thing. It's always going after the real food. Let's see what we got on here. Sorry, I have to scroll through, folks, because I can only see one at a time. I miss my computer. Hey, Matt, Ad Adnan, 
uh, I could squeeze all my leg and butt muscles real hard, very good, and like that, go into squatting. But it tires me more quickly than to just go into squats and have some muscles uh, auto work, your thoughts. So this is something to be aware of, uh, depending on the circumstances. I was speaking about this the other day with a friend of mine. It's like, there's a difference between training and there's a difference between sport. Now in sport, you want to embrace efficiency. So if you came to me and you're like, dude, I got a contest of how many squats can I do in five minutes? I'd be like, great, auto-regulate that stuff. You want to bounce out of the bottom position. You want to be as relaxed as humanly possible to get the exercise done. You want to be efficient. Fantastic. But if you came to me and you're like, I want my legs to be big and as strong as possible, like squeeze the mother living hell out of those suckers. You want them to be strong. You want them to be working very, very, very strong. That doesn't mean you got to turn everything up so much that you can barely move because then that turns into an isometric, which is one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of isometric training. You'll never work your muscles harder than you will during an isometric, but you're not going to move very well. Just know that. <laughs> Just know that in the martial arts, that's a big detriment. People are sparring and they're all like tight. They're like, Argh! and they're fighting people off and they're like, come on, you know, and they're all tight and it's like, I it can't move. Meanwhile, like Bruce Lee guys are like, pa bam, and they're all nice and loose and fast. So it depends on the circumstances. Do you benefit from more tension or less tension in efficiency? And then regulating your tension accordingly. Okay. It's not one is better than the other. It depends on what you're going after. <clears throat> hey, Daniel saying I've been watching your channel for a long time, but first time on the live stream. Welcome, my friend. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Dave coming on with some valuable experience. I was dogmatic with calisthenics and kettlebells. Then I did a barbell deadlift made me realize that each are just tools. Absolutely. And, and that's exactly it. You know, it's not about what tool you use. Like, I honestly don't care what exercises you do. I don't think it's important. I, what a program are you using? Do you use free weights versus machines? Remember, your results don't depend on what you do for your exercise. They depend on those fundamental processes that I was speaking about earlier on, stimulus and adaptation. If you stimulate your biceps to contract progressively harder, they're going to get bigger and stronger. I don't care if it's pull-ups or hammer strength machines or barbell curls or bands or lifting small children. It's not important. What is going on is you have the same fundamental stimulus. You're going to get the same result, which gives you the freedom to do whatever the hell you want, which is great. You don't like that diet approach. You don't like this type of exercise. You don't like going to the gym or whatever it is. Get rid of it. This is the big message that I always want to teach people is that this whole fitness thing should be a hell of a lot easier than we currently make it because we do things purely because we think we have to. And my message is very simple. No, you don't. In fact, it's ripping you off because looking back on my history, I think of all of the work I did, all of those rules I used to follow and stuff. And not only were they completely unnecessary, but they were preventing me from doing the things I should have been doing. Okay, because we live in a finite universe, my friends. You only have so much time, you only have so much energy, you only have so many resources as far as equipment and stuff. Every rep, every second, and every ounce you spend doing things you don't like doing is taking away from the things you do. And that's why it's so important to say no to things that are not important to you. Because it's literally taking away things in your life, stealing from you, ripping you off when you could be doing something much better, much more rewarding, much more satisfying, and much more effective. So it's not a case of, well, it's hard, but it feels good when it's over. Besides, you know, if it's that hard and stuff, it's going to be worth it in the end. Don't make that assumption. Don't be an idiot like me and assume that's going to be the case. Because more often than not, it's not. There's a very good chance that you could wind up two years from now looking back and realize you're in exactly the same place you are now. No progress whatsoever. You're not any leaner, stronger, healthier, more fit. And everything you've done for the next two years has largely been a waste. At which point you're going to be pissed off and you're probably going to give up. And if you give up, 
You're not giving up on the things you don't want to do. You're giving up on the goals you want to achieve, which is even sadder. So not only did those things steal your time and your energy and your effort, they stole your hopes and dreams, which is terrible because they're still attainable. So that's why I'm making this episode to say, do the things you want to do. And if there's something out there that you feel is not worth the cost, talk to me you know, reddeltaproject at gmail.com. There's a million ways to do everything. There's no good reason to do things you don't really feel comfortable or want to do. Zero. It's either desired or required. If it's neither of those, give up on it. Let's see. <clears throat> More questions here. Got to scroll through a lot of people like in channel. Thank you very, very much. Super appreciate it. Here we go. Jen Zem. Hey, Matt. I am hearing after a uh, blinding flash of the obvious on my port part. Now you pragmatism, cost benefit and kiss. Yes. Uh, with some due diligence in the mix, very good and stir, uh, sturdy information. Thank you very much. See, it's gotta be practical folks. You know, this is one of the things that I'm sort of becoming aware of. I'm unfollowing people left and right in my newsletter feeds and my podcasts and stuff like that on people who are, <sighs> I, I, how do I, how do I say this? They talk about like, Oh, it's all mindset. You got to think positive and you got to be, you know, positive and, and a uh, lot of like, not pseudoscience. What am I, I'm trying to, there's no meat to it. It's like, okay. And then you click off the podcast and you're like, well, what do I do? Like, it's gotta have some sort of practical application. So what you want to do after this podcast, I want you to literally be aware and paying attention to everything you're doing over the next week in your diet and your workout program and say, is this worth it? You're already doing it subconsciously. You're already having that emotional balance sheet of cause to benefit ratio. But if there's ever something that you're like, you know what, if I'm really honest, I'd really rather not be doing whatever it is, working out at 5 a.m. or doing 100 kettlebell cleans or uh, giving up chocolate or whatever, right? If there's something out there that if I was a magic genie and I was like, your wish is my commit uh, is granted. You can get rid of anything you want in your diet and exercise habits and has suffered no ill consequences whatsoever. What would that be? Because I'm here to tell you that there's a very good chance you can probably do that. You probably can give that thing up and do some modifications, still achieve your results. Hell, you probably even achieve it better. That's what we're working out here. It's not just about saving time and 15 minutes in the day. Let's see what else do we, what we got here. My Robert, <clears throat> do you think lower intensity but more frequency is better for natural bodybuilding to keep the muscle building signal up or should, uh, would three full body workouts day be as effective? You know, to be perfectly honest, I don't think it may matter one way or the other. So here's the, here's the honest truth about building muscle. We don't really know how to do this, uh, to be perfectly frank with you. Uh, it's the same thing again with weight loss. We have yet to create a reliable way to both lose and build, uh, lose weight and build muscle. Because if we did, then it'd be like, well, everybody who's successful does it this way, so do it that way. But it's not. There are plenty of people who do repetitions of something every day and they get jacked. And there are plenty of people who do the exact same thing and get nothing whatsoever. And there are plenty of people who do full body three times a week and they get jacked. And there are countless others who do that same thing and they get nothing. So it probably doesn't really boil down to that sort of training method, is it? So here's, here's, here's the thing is, to be perfectly honest, I don't know really what you know, to do to build muscle. Science is still confuddled with this sort of thing. Every time we think we have the answer, we put it into an isolated lab, we test it, and we get butkus. It's like, oh, it's a spike in hormones from heavy lifting. Let's isolate that. No, that didn't work out. Oh, it's eating a huge amount of protein. And we actually like that. Uh, no, that didn't work either. It's like, let's do this. Uh, so right now, the only things that we can kind of correlate strongly to it is, are you working your muscles progressively harder over time? Okay. So are your muscles just working harder, both in how much tension they have and how long they're holding the tension for? And are you able to have a cycle of, you know, your creating a stress in the muscle and then recovery. Those are the only two things I can confidently say 
are probably what we want to focus on. Everything else, all bets are off. <laughs> As far as training volume, as far as training frequency, as far as what exercises you're doing and stuff, I really don't think we can reliably make any sort of recommendation telling you what you should be doing. So then this is, this is the, the key here, folks. When it comes to, okay, training every day versus three times a week, now take that and apply it for yourself and be like, can I make that progressive workload and recovery happen better if I have more frequent but lighter intensity stuff or less frequent high intensity stuff. Because you can do it either way, right? We've got plenty of empirical evidence in the world that it can work, but it really boils down to what's your experience? If you do, let's say 50 push-ups every single day, at the end of the week, do you feel like I'm getting stronger? Yeah, this is feeling good. I've got the muscles working really hard. This is awesome. Or at the end of the week, are you like, oh God, 50 push-ups, and you get down on the floor and you're like, oh, my joints, oh, my muscles are really not feeling it today kind of thing. There's your feedback. That's what you should be basing your information off of. Same thing with the three a days, three times a week, all right? Three weeks, I used to do that. Full body workouts, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Looking back now, those Friday workouts were the worst because my body was kind of beat up from the first two. It wasn't really recovered. So it was like, oh God, this Friday workout's going to kill me. And it's like, oh, and I got through it and stuff. But was it really better? No. Was it really progressive? No. Did I get more weight, or more reps or better technique? No, I got through it. In other words, that workout ripped me off. I put all that time and that energy and stuff into those Friday workouts and I shouldn't have been doing them. I should have been recovering more so that way, when I got to Monday or maybe Sunday, I'd be like, yeah, let's crush this mother. Here we go. This is going to feel so good. I'm so jonesing for these pull-ups. That's what we want to have. Do you get that more with the higher frequency stuff or the lower frequency stuff? The lower intensity or the higher intensity? That's what you want to be looking for, my friend, because that's going to lead you towards the road towards your gains. <clears throat> let's see. What else can we do? He's talking here uh, three days a week. My joints have healed up and I'm very uh, making progress. Any thoughts? Hey, hey, if you're making progress, it's working. That's the bottom line. The biggest mistake I see people make when it comes to diet and exercise is they'll come to me and they're like, Matt, so I've been eating this way. And I've been training this way and uh, losing weight you know, at this rate. And I'm feeling good and my reps are going up and I'm starting to fill up my shirts a little better. I'm really happy with this. So what do you think if I try and train this other way instead? I'm like, dude, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> You've got a program that's working. You've got methods that are going in the right direction. Why are you changing things up with some totally unproven thing that you just saw on Instagram? Right? Oh, they said it's so great and so wonderful. Who's they? <laughs> Who cares? It doesn't matter. If you're making progress and you're like, yeah, this seems to be working for me. I'm really liking this. Keep going. <laughs> don't change anything. If you have a good plan that's working, the number one rule of a good game plan is don't change the plan until you either have something that needs to change or you're like, well, I'm feeling good if I do this, but boy, if I uh, you know, have an extra set, I feel like it could be better. Well, then go for that. But big changes and stuff, if it's working for you, keep on it, keep going, because progress is hard to find, my friend. You know, I, know, I know that's kind of what we expect out of fitness, but the reality is most people don't get very far from diet and exercise habits. It doesn't work most of the time. And what it does work, they don't maintain it very well. So the bottom line is, and this is one of the reasons why I always say that my mission with the Red Delta Project is to figure out how fitness works is because most of the time it doesn't. Fitness, by and large, how we practice it is still a colossal failure. We're still having single digit victory points with this stuff. You know, you get a lot of survivor bias on social media. Like, look at these guys. They're huge. They're jacked. They're wonderful. And they do this kind of training program. Like, yeah, but you don't see the 99% of the other people who did the same program who got nothing, right? This is how a lot of programs work. Jim has some sort of a, a program they're doing, and they take the top 1% of 1% as their testimonials, and that's supposedly proof that their program works. We don't want to base it off of that sort of thing. 
by and large, diet and exercise, as we know and as we practice it, is still not working very well. And that's based on my uh, definitions of success. My definitions of success is most people do this, most people get what they want. Now, of course, it's never going to be 100%, but it's got to still be the majority of people get what they want. That's why, like those advertisements, you know, back in uh, the infomercial days, they'd always have that little phrase at the bottom of the line, results not typical. And I always look at that and be like, who the hell buys this stuff then? Because if I see that, that's literally telling me most people don't get this. If you walked into a restaurant and you were like, I'll have the filet mignon, and the waiter said, well, uh, you probably won't be able to get it. You know, we're shortage in the kitchen or something like that. I was like, oh, oh. Well, uh, then uh, I'll have the uh, prime rib. Oh, very good, sir. Right? We want a, the odds in our favor, don't we, folks? We want to know that we can probably get what we want, not rolling the dice like it's a lottery game and saying, oh, I hope I'm one of the lucky 1%. No. When you bet against the odds, you usually lose. And that's unfortunately what mostly happens in fitness these days. It doesn't work very well for most people. And I'm trying to change that. Uh, drop weight daddy Michael coming in again and saying, Matt, just uh, on the 3P rule, it helped me lose 140 pounds. Yes, I knew, Michael. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Let's see, what else can we do? A lot, a lot of good conversations going on, people. I really appreciate this. The RDP community is strong. This is wonderful, wonderful. But uh, anyway, I should probably be wrapping stuff up here. I got a fondue party to go to later tonight anyway. And my Buffalo Bills are playing the Patriots in the playoffs. Hopefully they put up a good game. So I will bid you all adieu. I hope uh, maybe this has been helpful, but at least get the ball rolling and thinking. Remember, your homework for this week is to just start doing a little bit of assessment around things that are seemingly costing you a lot. A lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of effort and stuff. And being honest with yourself of, is it worth it? And if it's not, we got to look for some other things. And if it is, awesome, wonderful, great. Continue on with that approach as well. So I will talk to you next week. Hopefully my computer will be fixed. And uh, direct questions, reddeltaproject at gmail.com. Very much for watching and listening. Remember, resources down below for all the things that support the show, like my books, NOSC, affordable suspension training equipment, and, of course, the dynamic pull-up handles for a doorway as well. Talk to you next week. Till then, be fit and live free.